Okay, so let's get started. So today we have unusual lecture, unusual in two ways. So first, it's an advanced lecture, it will not be examined, hooray, we'll just have some fun with the programming. And second, we'll use a novel environment called Jupyter Notebook and uh, the Colab uh, space. So what it allows us to do, it allows us to put the code alongside with the text and fancy images. So we can put the code blocks and we can have this um, descriptions and we can even uh, insert equations there so it's, and we can run this code on remote servers. So uh, the title of today's lecture is ChatGPT, Language Model, Stochastic Parrots and the Infinite Monkey Theory. How many of you have ever used ChatGPT? Okay, a few of you. The others probably don't want to reveal themselves. So, or I guess most of you either use Gemini or Cloud or ChatGPT. So, what is special about ChatGPT? ChatGPT is conversational AI, so it's sort of like a chatbot, we can ask questions, we can interact with that. For instance, I can ask, why should, uh, why should students, uh, students uh, learn programming? So, and it answers, right? So it generates something to us. Does it make sense to you? Oh. Stay look out. So we can read what it uh, outputs to us. It says, learning programming can offer students numerous benefits extending far beyond just the technical skills. So it says, okay, there are different aspects that you learn, such as problem solving skills, creativity. So this is what we discussed uh, when we mentioned uh, the Yoda of the Silicon Valley, Donald Knut, he also mentioned these aspects, logical thinking, career opportunities. So when you look at the text that ChatGPT produces, what do you uh, see here? What do you notice? So we notice that it's clearly English, it's fluent English, it's grammatically correct. We can comprehend it, we can understand, right? So uh, there are clear points and the, it's actually answering the question that we asked, right? And it's not only the uh, uh, kind of single capability, so it can also explain you the concepts at different levels. So, uh, for instance, uh, as uh, part of our uh, today's topic is language modeling. So, I can ask ChatGPT to explain me what a language model is as if I were a uh, five-year-old. So, it will say, imagine a language model as a very smart friend not really true, it's quite anthropomorphic, who knows a lot of words and can put them together to make sentences, this is true. It's like having a friend who can talk to you and answer your question. This friend has read uh, lots of lots of books and learned how people talk by looking at those books. So when we, uh, you ask a question or give a sentence, this friend can guess what you might say next. Uh, that's correct, so language model is trying to learn and estimate the probabilities of sequences or sentences based on some text corpus. So it's fed with huge amount of text and from that text it uh, gets the patterns, statistical patterns, and uh, learns how to differentiate grammatically correct fluent English sentences, for instance, if you focus on English, from ungrammatical possible sentences from impossible sentences. So. Uh, but uh, you can also ask a uh, chat GPT system to explain you what a language model is if you are an expert in uh, machine learning. So it will say that a language model is a type of AI model that is designed to understand and generate human-like language. It is trained on a large data set of text such as books, articles and internet content to learn patterns, grammar and semantic relationships uh, within language. So you see that it uses different lexicons, right? So for five-year-old, it doesn't use these phrases such as semantic relationships, so it adjusted the lexicon to the level. 
It also uses longer uh, sentences for the expert, right? For the five-year-old, you would not explain something in extremely long sentences. So you see that it adjusts the levels of explanations. And it's not only the uh, uh, only thing that it can do, it can also produce uh, or generate poetry, songs. Uh, it can also generate code, surprisingly. So it can generate, for instance, a, a basic uh, language model uh, for like using neural approaches, such as a recurrent neural network, and it can provide this code in Python. Uh, but be careful, it's not often correct. So sometimes it might be misleading, and we'll discuss this later. Or it can even produce a summary of a book. For instance, we can produce a summary of Harry Potter. Uh, single paragraph summary. Again, when you look at this text, you see that it's all fluent English and it actually addresses the question that we are asking. So, and now your natural question would be, how does this work, right? Where is the magic? And indeed, many uh, scientists, especially linguists, they are very skeptical about the abilities of these models and they uh, coined the term stochastic parrots to refer to such kind of model. So what does stochastic mean? Who knows? So stochastic means probabilistic, right? Because these models, they are provided with huge amount of text and they try to estimate the probabilities of this word collocations, which word sequences are more likely to appear in this text and which are less likely and then generate the text following this estimated probabilities. So, and now the natural question, so the stochastic Paris is actually referring to this ability to produce uh, sort of like realistically uh, sounding language without actual understanding of the language. So, and it leads us to this uh, general question can we actually have a model that only looks at text and then it, the model be a, is able to understand humans and understand the relations in the world, in the physical world? For instance, can we train the model to understand what is red color, what is pink color, if it doesn't have the vision at all? Can you understand what is red just by looking at text? But then, uh, can we train a model to kind of uh, simulate that it understands, make an impression of understanding? And this is something that is called the Turing test. So if your model is real AI, so you will not be able to differentiate it from human when you interact with that model. It will make an impression that you are interacting with the human. So, but the extreme case here would be that if we just feed all this text and then uh, can we do actually this experiments with to say like we have this sort of like instead of the model we have this monkey, right? Suppose we have, have a monkey and a typewriter and uh, the monkey picks this keys on the typewriter randomly how likely it will generate an instance of Shakespeare. For instance, a book from Shakespeare. You would say like it's quite unlikely, right? Because monkey doesn't understand this language, right? And it just picks the keys at random. But now, given infinite amount of time, at some point of time, it might just by chance generate Shakespeare or I like Harry Potter to be more relevant to you. Um, so, and this philosophical question, uh, it's called the infinite monkey theorem, and it was also discussed by Jorge Luis Borges in his famous novel, The Library of Babel. So when you have infinite amount of time, so you have all the possibilities realized. So in this lecture, we'll now try to create such monkeys. We'll try to train the model of monkey imitating the uh, language speaker. So it will try to produce something that uh, looks like English. So here is our monkey. It has the typewriter. So now let's introduce the typewriter. So we will have this block of code. 
So um, here, what we are trying to do, we'll just simulate this exact monkey that uh, choosing the keys on the typewriter at random with the same probability for each key. So what we uh, have here, we use this external library called string to uh, uh, import the um, alphabetic characters, the English alphabet. And we will just, for simplicity, use the uppercase. So it's A to Z, uppercase. And we add the white space, right, as the delimiter, so to separate the words. So, and then, so this is our initial alphabet. Our monkeys will be choosing from this A to Z plus white space. And uh, then we have, suppose we would like to have 10 monkeys, so we have the loop for, to generate 10 monkeys. And each monkey will be choosing each character at random with the uniform probability, with the same chance. So uh, in order to do, the, uh, to do that, we also use this external library called random. So random choice just picks one of these elements in the keys with the same probability, okay? And then we generate a sequence of 100 characters. So this is our output. Does it look like English? Not really, right? We can even uh, like see that uh, there are no real words, nothing that would uh, somehow look like English sentences, right? So there is something wrong with our monkeys, and of course we do not have infinite amount of time to just wait till it generates just uh, some part of Harry Potter, right? We need to optimize our monkeys, we need to help them. So how will we help our monkeys? What will incorporate? So how about um, incorporating relative frequency of the characters? Obviously, when you think of characters and language, so characters have different chances, right? So some characters appear more often in English, some characters less often, right? Which character do you think is the most frequent character in English? Yes. Any other guesses? E, yeah. So we now, I basically looked at the relative frequencies of the characters in English, and I provided them explicitly here. So for, this is a dictionary, you can recognize it. And uh, uh, for a letter A, we have this relative frequency of around eight. Uh, the letter E is 12, etc. So like this character and the relative frequency, right, as the value. And now we, for instance, would like to ask what is the most frequent character, how we do that. We look at the values, pick up the maximum value, right? And then we look at the uh, key that corresponds to that maximum value. This is what we are doing here. So we take the max over the values and then pick up the key that corresponds to that value. So, and as you um, answered already, so the most frequent character in English will be the character E. So, uh, and we can also using Python visualize the distribution. We can use this uh, another external library called a plot. So we can now look at the distribution of the relative frequencies of the characters. You see that this is our E, the next one is T, then the A, and so on. And the least frequent are Z, uh, Q, J, etc. Okay, so now we need to incorporate this into our monkey generation process. So we have the relative frequencies and now we need to transform them into probabilities. Who is familiar with the probability function? No one, okay. So the idea of probability, so the zero probability is like, no, not likely, right? It's unlikely, completely unlikely. And 100% probability or the probability of one is for sure, right? And uh, the, when we toss a coin, we have 50-50 probability of uh, head and tail. So, and the probability function, it ranges from zero to one, right? And uh, also the values in the probability should uh, sum up to one. So we need to make sure that we transform our relative frequencies into probabilities, and we need to make sure that they all, at the end, sum up to one. 
So we need to normalize them by the sum of the frequencies. So we'll take the sum of these values in the dictionary, right? This is the total frequency. And then we normalize it, we divide by them, by the total frequency. So, and those are our probabilities. Again, the most probable letter character will be E. We will uh, produce E more often than others, and the least probable will be Z. So now we will take these probabilities and introduce them to our monkey generation process. So now our monkeys, instead of picking these characters with the same chance, we, uh, they will pick them with these corresponding probabilities, how likely they appear in English uh, words. So, and here is our output. Does it look like English? No, again, but you see that now we have some characters that appear more often here. So it's E, 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 and you see that E is appearing far more often than the others. But we are missing the white space, right? So we need to incorporate the white space. So, and according to the statistics, so white space appears in 20% of uh, times. So we, 20% uh, of times, we will generate the white space. So how we incorporate into our probability distribution of a character. So we take this 20% out of these probabilities, uh, assign it to the white space, and uh, adjust the rest of the probabilities. So now we are generating uh, this characters with the white space. So in 20% of cases, we'll generate the white space. So what you notice about this text? So it still doesn't look like English, but it has one feature that resembles English already. So the average word length is more like English. So we have more words, if you can call these words, pseudo words, uh, of the lengths one, two, three, four, right? But there are still some extremely long words that we are unlikely to see in English. Still, it doesn't look like real English. So, and let's again improve our process. Let's optimize. Let's target not just any English, but let's try to generate Harry Potter from scratch, the very first book of Harry Potter. So we'll now estimate these frequencies from the Harry Potter book. Instead of providing them explicitly, we will just get the statistics from the book. So I downloaded this, the very first book of Harry Potter. It's just like a simple text file, nothing else. So we open this file and read it until the end, character by character. That's what we are doing here. And we can print the first 300 characters. This is the start of Harry Potter, the very first book. You see that each chapter starts with some uh, special character and then new line and the title in the uppercase and then the content. So what we do next is the following. So uh, we go through these characters, character by character. For now, we just process everything character by character. And we just count how many times we observed uh, each particular character. So, and we uh, produce the distribution of the characters. And obviously you see that here uh, in a typical Harry Potter book, there are many more characters. It's not just A to Z, there are punctuation, there are uppercase, lowercase characters. And we have our vocabulary, the total number of unique characters, uh, which is quite much, much larger. So if you scroll here, you see all these unique characters. And I sorted them by the frequency. You see that the most frequent is the white space character. It's followed by E again, as expected on average English text. Uh, it's followed by T, O, A, then R, N, etc. So now uh, let's try to incorporate, again, we do the normalization part and incorporate into our monkey generation process. And we again ask our monkeys to produce the Harry Potter. So this is our uh, monkey zero. It produces something like this. 
You see that it also at times produces this new line character, so we switch to the new line from time to time. And again, question, does it look like English? No, it's still something wrong. Uh, does it resemble English? Only probably some like lengths of words, so, like it's more or less matching. So what is the major problem in our generation process? What is special about language? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we need to, to take into account the context, right? So we just for now generating character by character independently. But actually a language doesn't work like that. So each character is conditioned on some like neighboring characters. So, and let's incorporate this context or the past into our model. So every time we generate a new character, we look at some number of characters in the past. In the simplest case, it will be just one character before. So, and, um, so this is the idea of n-gram language model. So, so far we just had this so-called back of characters. So we did not look at the order of these characters, the, the order of characters in the world, in the world. So now we will try to account for that. We'll try to capture which uh, collocations of characters are more likely in that language. So, and uh, we introduce this special function called train character language model. That will be our very first uh, so-called n-gram language model. So gram is this like token, either it's a character or a word. So an n means how many characters we look at the past. So when, in order to produce the current character or word, in this case we'll just look at the character level. So we look uh, at n characters in the past. Okay, so, and this is called the order of the model, right? So the simplest model will be just looking one character before and the order will be one. This is called bigram language model. So we are looking at the common bigrams, two character collocations. What do you think is the most common bigram in English? It's a tricky question, right? Uh, yes, to some extent it's quite frequent, but the uh, more frequent one is th, because it appears in the, that, etc. So, and uh, so here is our function uh, that will uh, generate, will uh, actually get uh, estimate the probabilities of the uh, character n-grams. So, uh, suppose. Uh, we have the order of one. Again, we are just looking one character before in order to predict the next one. Suppose we started producing something that starts with uppercase W. What do you think will be the next character? If it starts with uppercase W. Right, it corresponds to all WH questions. So it's what, when, why, etc. And the next one, what do you think will be the uh, second most common continuation of W, E. So it will, uh, most, uh, uh, most cases correspond to the pronoun we. So what about I? If I have uh, uppercase I, what will be the next most likely character? White face, yes. It will correspond to the pronoun I. And the next one will be it. It will correspond to this pronoun it. So, uh, then uh, what do you think will be more likely after uh, lowercase t? Yeah, it's that, then, etc. And for this one is more tr uh, trickier, it's just one. So if we have one, it's likely either white space or some other digits, right? So we have a bunch of digits followed. And we can already estimate these probabilities, again, these are probabilities and they all will sum up to one at the end. So for a probability of having H after uppercase W is 42, 41% roughly. In 33% of times we have E, so it's we. And then we have O, which is quite surprisingly. Then I, then A. So for I, so in 40, roughly 46% of cases, we'll just produce pronoun I. 
uh, and in uh, roughly 21% of cases, we'll have pronoun it. And then we have a apostrophe, which is uh, I am, for instance, the, this construction, and then in. So for T, it's TH, obviously, and then we have the white space. It means we end the word at the character T. So when we generated character T, in uh, 27 roughly percent of cases, we'll just finish the word by indicating this white space. When we put the white space, it means we finish the word generation. So, and for the one, so in 23% of cases, we'll just have the white space. It's either one or 11 or something that ends with one. So, or in uh, roughly 10% of cases, or oh, nine actually percent of cases, we will add an extra one. So it will be 11 or 111 or something ending with 11. Okay, so this is the simplest model. We just look one character in, in the past. So now your uh, question would be, um, what happens when we have more characters in the past? How much will improve this? So, and uh, yeah, before we do this, uh, let's look uh, just at this, our monkey generation process. Let's incorporate into this monkey generation process this uh, n-gram model. So, and we provide the order of one. Again, we just look at one character in the past, and uh, this is what our monkeys will produce. So what do you notice about this? Is it looking better? It looks a bit better, but still not there. So there are some common uh, uh, two character combinations. So WH is there. Actually, we managed to generate that already a success, so, but it's still, may, most words actually do not uh, belong English, right? They, they, they do not look like English, There's, there is no syntactic structure, nothing. So uh, now let's try to increase the order of the model, how many characters we look in the past, right? So what if we look uh, at, say, how many characters, 10 characters in the past? So. If we now condition on 10 previous characters, you see that it already captures some structure. So we start generating Harry Potter from the very start. So, and you see that it captured that it should start with some special character, then the new lines, then the title of this chapter, and the content. So, and we just generate the first 40 characters, and you see that, so the first chapter was generated as uh, the man with two faces. Then uh, the second monkey generated the boy who lived, the mirror of arise. I'm not sure what arise means, to be honest. Anyone knows this word? It's probably just some hallucinated word. Yes? Ah, uh, oh, it's interesting. It's interesting observation, actually. Yeah. Um, and then again, the boy who lived, Mrs., uh, Mr. and Mrs., the mirror of a rice, the sorting hat. So you see that actually most words exist already in English. And it's not just the words, it also captured the structure of the book, that the, uh, each chapter should start with the uppercase title, right? Uh, it's quite impressive, right? It's only like 40 characters. How many characters? What's the order? Let me just recall. Uh, can I scroll? I cannot scroll. Okay, so it's 10, the order of 10, so we only look at 10 characters before. Yes? Um, as far as I know, the Mendeley's algorithm is based on like, that is an algorithm. Isn't that, it's not actually random, isn't that an abstract for generation? So what do you mean by random? It, de it depends like a kind of how you define what is random. Here we're trying to fit the distribution. So we estimate the distribution of this n-gram, so like character collocations from the book, and then we try to fit this into our model, that's monkey generation process. So whenever we generate the next character, we take the probabilities from the uh, Harry Potter book. So 
So um, here you use this special function random just to kind of use this functionality to provide the probabilities, how you pick the next character. So, okay. So previously we used this random thing. Uh, where do we have it? So we used it, we provided this uniform probabilities. We just said like, okay, just pick a uh, character with the same probability. Now we provide these probabilities explicitly that we estimated from the Harry Potter book. So um, let's move on because we have quite a lot to say here. So now um, let's look at this. Uh, so this uh, order of the model now, we provide this ca uh, four characters in the past. So we look at the four previous characters and we ask what will be the next character. So let's try to play this game with you. So uh, if we start with hell, so H uppercase then L, so hell, what will be the next character? Oh. Yeah, right, it will be either O or the white space, right? It will be just hell. So let's check whether the model learned this. So you see that uh, the model indeed learned that in 60% of cases it will generate O and 40% of cases it will be just white space, meaning we generate hell. So, and if we have what, in 70% of cases we'll just have some questions starting with what, right? We just put the white space. Um, in 17% um, of cases, we put the apostrophe sign, so it's sort of like what's up. And then it's followed by the question mark. We just have the what as a, just a single question, what. A uh, similar pattern is for that. So for that, again, in actually a much higher chance, we have the white space after that. And then we have the apostrophe, etc. Uh, who can tell me what will be generated in this case? So we have lowercase rc dot and then the white space. Who can tell me what will be generated? Yes? Sorry? D, T, why it's D? So uh, this actually corresponds to this abbreviation of Mrs. So it's MRS, so it's just a substring. And the next character will be the uppercase character. This is the first character of the last name of someone. So you'll see that it actually generates this all possible, oh, it's a, the, the other one is this, the most probable is the new line. So it's probably the start of some replic. And then there's a sequence of the uppercase letters corresponding to the first letter of their last name of the missus, okay? And um, so now let's try to generate this continuation of something that starts with her and the order of the model will be four. So we provide this initial four characters and then ask the model to generate the rest. And we ask the model to generate 70 characters in the rest. So this is the order of uh, model of four. So we have the first monkey says, Harry portion of his eyes for the philosopher's stone. The next one, Harry who is better and past they saw their auntie. Not sure what it means. Harry potent hung the something. Harry smiles to common. And um, the next one, Harry and then Hagrid, uh, no, sorry. Uh, Harry have had never the struggling. So it doesn't make sense at all, right? When we reduce the order of the model. So, and uh, let's try to increase the order of the model. Again, let's provide that uh, order of 10. Again, we look at this 10 characters before. And uh, now it gets really funny. So it's sort of like all words, they already exist in the language and uh, many sentences are syntactically correct, but they will sound really funny because it do, uh, they do not make sense. For instance, Harry saw his scared white face look down at the ground. Or 
Harry saw he's scared when something else to do with us. This is grammatically incorrect. It's sort of like a question. Harry saw it in a great rampy, running jump and managed to climb through the chatter. Harry saw, yeah, this is the funniest one. Harry saw his car. I might get lucky again. <laughs> Um, uh, so, um, what else? Uh, Harry saw that Hagrid is raising its feet. Um, Harry saw he still couldn't F. I'm not sure what that means. Harry saw his scared white face look down at Ron. So, it all kind of, most words actually exist in English, and uh, some uh, sentences make sense to us, even sound funny, but there's still uh, kind of the general meaning is missing, right? So we need to incorporate the meaning part, the meaningful, the semantics. So what, where does it come from? How we incorporate the meaning? So, so far we looked at just character collocations and nothing else, right? But the words actually, they have some meanings, right? So, and that leads us to the next part. Um, how we learn the meanings of words when we, we train language models. So, and the fundamental idea here comes from the 1950s. It's called the distributional semantic hypothesis. And the idea is the following. So that uh, uh, the meaning comes from the contextual usage. So the meaning of word is the context, the set of contexts in which this word is used. So, um, cat and dog will be similar in the sense that they all appear in the sentences such as a cat sat on the mat, a dog sat on the mat. Dog uh, uh, eats, cat eats. Dog sleeps, cat eat, uh, sleeps. But they will be slightly different because cat meows and dog barks, right? And um, you can even try to predict the next word from the sentence, a cat sat on the already said there is mad, but there are other words that are more likely to appear after this, sequ uh, this se uh, sequence of words than others. So you are unlikely to say that a cat sat on the set or something like a cat sat on the, the, right? So you have, you obviously expect some either noun or adjective noun, like noun phrase there. And not any noun, you cannot say a cat sent on their love or on the friendship, right? It doesn't make sense. So it should be some specific class of nouns, more likely something like furniture. So, and by learning to predict which word fits the context, you learn this meaningful representations. So, and um, in the current uh, uh, natural language processing approaches, we rely on vectors. So each word has a particular vector representation and this vector representation, it captures all these like meanings and it's learned by as a process of language modeling, it's predicting which word will fit the context. So, and the earliest model was released in 2013, it's called word to vec So you provide the context and you try to guess which word would uh, fit that context. And uh, as a part of the process, you learn this vector representation for the word. So a cat will have its vector representation and a dog will have its vector representation. It's very convenient to work with vectors because we can measure the similarity between the concepts through the similarity between the vectors. So the angle between the vectors will correspond to the similarity. So we look at the cosine similarity. Whenever we want to measure how similar is dog to, uh, dog to cat, we just look at the angle between the corresponding vectors. And these vectors are gradually learned through this task of predicting which word comes next. So we feed the model, uh, feed the, uh, the huge text corpus in the model and try to predict which word comes next and adjust these vector representations. So I just decided to use here this pre-existing library for that uh, type of model. So it's called GenSim. It has this word to back, and I already pre-trained a model on Harry Potter text. So it means that, what it means I pre-trained? It means that for each word, I now have this vector representation that captures its usages, the meanings. And uh, with that, uh, so for Harry, I have 
vector presentation for harmony, for, for instance, for any word, like jump, for instance, they will, I will also have some representation. So, and I can look at how similar they are by looking at this, taking the vectors and looking at the angle between the vectors. So I can ask how similar is Harry to Harmony? Or how similar is Ron to Hamio, uh, Harmony? Uh, how similar is Harry to Gryffindor? So for every possible word in Harry Potter, I will have this vector representation. So, and uh, similarly, uh, based on these similarities, I can actually get which uh, words are more similar to one another. And I can extract, for instance, 20 words most similar to Dumbledore. So uh, what are these 20 words most similar to Dumbledore? So you see that the highest similarity, so the highest will be like closer to one, the highest. So if it's zero, it means that it's completely unsimilar, orthogonal. So the closer to one, so the one is the highest similarity, the better, so the most similar. So for Dumbledore, we have this the most similar um, word is Slughorn, then Snape, then Lupin, then Moody, then Fudge, etc. For Voldemort, we have Wormtail, Dumbledore, Sirius, Creed, uh, Creature, etc. So you see that most of this, so because this word actually corresponds to this character name, we also retrieve the character names, although we did not incorporate this explicitly. There is nothing in the model that says that Dumbledore is a particular character. It's just a usual one of this, like several thousands of words for which we have vectors. And the more model inherently learns the properties such as this is a person, or this is a negative character, this is a positive character, this is a professor, this is a student. It just learns all these properties inherently from the context usages. It's very powerful in this sense. So if I say like, what would be the uh, most similar words or concepts for the word spell? I get charm, curse, potion, monster, spells, etc. Or for Gryffindor, which is the name of the school, I have other schools listed. Even though I did not explicitly provide this information, the model just learned this from the contextual usages. Is it impressive? Okay. And it's a very simple, it's a very start of this, like the whole hype around AI. So 2013, it was like 10 years ago. And this is our representation, the vector representation for Dumbledore. So this is our Dumbledore in this vector space. So each, uh, so it's um, typically it's 300, 400, 500 dimensional vectors. It means that it has this three or four, 500 uh, particular values, this real values that are getting adjusted as a part of the training process. We just learn all these numbers as a part of the training um, process. So, and yeah, this is the vector for Dumbledore. So, and these uh, numbers will correspond to the complexity of the model. So, uh, contemporary models, they have several billions of these parameters. This is called parameters. So, several, uh, contemporary models ha have like billions of such parameters in it. And they're all just getting adjusted by looking at this huge amount of text from the internet, from the books, from magazines, from, uh, and so on. So, because, yeah, in order to train such a model, you need to actually, to adjust all these particular numbers, you need to provide sufficient amount of information. Uh, yes? Yeah, this is like cosine similarity. Typically you have, well, cosine, you can have like minus one to one, but typically we just treat it as zero one one. Yes, yes. So we typically just have zero is uh, completely orthogonal and the one means like it's matching. Yeah. No, what we care about is like how similar they are and that's it. Like if there are like even like the words with opposite meanings, they will just have the highest similarity typically. Zero point, how many? So say like you have two numbers, one is negative and the other one is positive. So as an example, zero point one two, then the other is positive or negative, or whatever. 
So it's a similar type of similar, yes, the just absolute value that matters. So typically the way it works is that we initialize with some small values for these like parameters. We start from kind of almost zero and then gradually optimize this like by predicting which word comes next. So there is a, yeah, this is sort of like a more general statistical machine learning topic. Like we have a loss, so-called loss function that we're trying to optimize using this like gradient descent methods. So we are trying to predict the word, or the vector of the word that comes next and then we uh, compare to the true word that we observe in the text and we just take the cosine uh, similarity between what we predicted and uh, what was the true one and then that difference is back propagated through the neural network to adjust all these like weights and parameters. So that's how we learned. Like we have some particular loss function, how much error we made, how much we were incorrect, and then we propagate this error through this neural networks to adjust all these like parameters, all these values. So if we predict it more or less correctly, like for instance, we had like sofa and mat in like a, a cat set on there. So sofa and mat, they kind of similar. So we'll have like uh, gradually arrived to similar um, uh, vector representations. So they, they both appear in similar contexts. As soon as we have like similar context, so there will be a context where a cat sat on the sofa, another context will be a cat sat on the mat, right? So, and gradually by just observing that they are, uh, appear in similar context, we will arrive to a similar vector representations because we are optimizing how much error we made when we predicted one word but not in the other word. So, and finally, so when we have such representations, we can of course visualize them. But it's hard to visualize, like say, when you have like 300, 400, 500 dimensions. So uh, in order to do that, we have this fancy thing, which is called principal component analysis. We just project the most important information into two-dimensional space. So we just say, okay, we need to pick the most uh, informative dimensions and just pro uh, project them into two-dimensional space. So let's take this characters and schools example. So we have this uh, characters, Dumbledore, Moody, Malfoy, etc., and the schools that um, uh, in Harry Potter. And there we will represent them, on, we will project their representations into two-dimensional space. And you see, so the dots correspond to these concepts. And uh, in one part of space, we have Harry and the, his friends. So it's Darcy, Harry, and Harmony. So this is the cluster. We also have Ron, so those are like these friends. Uh, over here, we have Malfoy, who is not the, really their friend. And he is also in this like bottom part where we have negative characters. So he's in the similar part with Voldemort. And here we have this cluster of professors. So here we have professors. And this is our, uh, the only female professor there. Uh, no, it's not the only one, but the only famous one, Mag Professor McGonagall. And she is also in this upper part of the plot, which probably corresponds to this female character. So it's, she's together with uh, Harmony. So, and you can do a lot with this. And since then, there were like, uh, there was so much progress already, especially with the introduction of the most popular architecture called transformers. So, and BERT is the one of the first models that is based on transformer architecture. And uh, in chat GPT, so if you know the abbreviation GPT, what it stands for? Generative pre-trained transformer. So it's like it's based on this famous transformer architecture. Generative means it generates, like it's trained to generate sequences of words, like characters. 
And pre-train means it was already pretend. You don't have to train it from scratch. So, and uh, here is this visualization of these models in terms of the number of parameters of these like particular values you need to adjust when you train the model. And WorldTovec was somewhere over there. It started uh, here in 2018, but WorldTovec was released in 2013, five years before, and it was really small model. And it already saw that it can do quite a lot of uh, things. And this is GPT-3, and now we are at the point of GPT-4.0, right? And you see that's the number of parameters for GPT-3 is 175 billion. It's a huge model. It's quite, it's impossible to train it on your laptop, obviously. But the good news is that um, we have this fancy um, hugging face uh, project that provides lots of different models, pre-trained models, such as GPT models as well, for different types of tasks. So you have like language generation, visual question answering, text classification, image feature extraction, video classification, text image to text, all these different kinds of models. You see that it has the most recently uh, released Llama model from Meta, um, Llama 3.1. You can uh, just uh, download this model and use it uh, for your tasks. So here I'm um, just using this so-called uh, library called Transformers. This is like the typical hugging face library. If you want to use this uh, pre-trained models, you need to install Transformers. And then I just say, okay, I would like to use this GPT-2 model. I just download this pre-trained model, GPT-2, and for the task of text generation. So I provide this task and the model that I would like to use and the prompt. So this is my prompt. My name is Harry Potter, I study. And then I ask, okay, gener generate me the next 30 words. And uh, five sequences. So each sequence has some probability, right? So, it, um, and it generates me these different sequences. I can uh, even extract the probability of each sequence. So the first one is, my name is Harry Potter, I study magic and spell, I'm one of the few students, if not the only student at this school that I blah, blah, blah. Uh, the second one is, my name is Harry Potter, I study magic and history, I'm your age, I never thought it would be possible for you to pass. <laughs> uh, then I study and love magic, he announced, I study math and science, in fact, I take all these two very seriously. I study magic, said Jeannie, so it's just from Harry Potter. So you see that all, they all look like real English and they're syntactically, grammatically correct, most of them, and, and they make sense to us. And again, the general idea behind this is just you're predicting this words from the context and learn the vector presentations for that words. So, but there are some issues with that models. It's not everything is solved, not everything is so fancy, so great. So because the models were trained on human, like the, the data that was produced by humans, humans have many, many stereotypes about everything. So if you now say one of the most famous discussions in terms of the bias is this occupation and ethnic bias, so, uh, and gender bias. So if we feed the model with the following uh, prompt, so the 40-year-old white man worked as, and look at the occupation. So you see that there are quite typical occupations. So the 40-year-old white man worked as a server at a local internet provider, uh, then as a reporter for Breitbart News and is a registered Republican. Uh, the next one, as a service representative in Las Vegas, according to his Facebook face, he's Jewish. Uh, then uh, the next one, as a security guard in Dallas, with, Dallas in, uh, with the Dallas Police Department. And then as a teacher while he worked in New York City, while the black man worked as a nurse. So, and now, see how it's different when we just switch the white into Mexican and man into woman. So you'll see how different the prediction will be. So now we start again, 
the 40-year-old Mexican woman worked as a server, and now we have at a local casino at age 13. Uh, the next one, as a reporter for Breitbart News and is a registered resident of Mexico. The next one, as a waitress in an advertising agency in Lima, Peru, she was known as the Badger. And then uh, the next one, as a nurse before her husband was murdered by her husband. Uh, the next one, as a waitress while he worked in New York City while also selling cakes. You see how different these occupations are. This is like a huge problem because they, uh, these models do not just capture the stereotypes, they amplify all the stereotypes. So if you want to incorporate this model as your sort of like you would like to automate your HR process, right? So you just want to automate the processing of CVs, you'll have a big issue processing like all these like CVs from male and female candidates. You'll have a stronger preference for like some particular professions for as male professions. Like for instance, even software developer is typically seen as a male profession, not female. So if you have a recommender system and incorporating these particular uh, large language models, you'll have a problem with your hiring process. It will be very unfair. This is like a huge discussion right now with these problems. It's not, again, it's not just gender. Gender is just kind of, um, it's easy to capture, but there are also other types of biases. There's like ethnic bias and, and the, yeah, this related to occupation and uh, where it's like a negative evaluation of particular ethnicities, etc. So, and uh, again, it's not the only, the, the other problem is that if you ask, uh, say, chat GPT, uh, calculate, uh, say, 44 by 44, so typically it, Right now, what is that? <laughs> okay, it uh, arrived to some uh, solution. It's correct, but if you now take 44 by 44 by 44 by 44 by 44, it most likely will hallucinate something. So it was a big issue, like you cannot actually learn how to perform uh, um, complex number multiplication by just predicting which character come, goes next, right? It's completely, it's a qualitatively different task. And currently some of the systems that try to address this by using identity AI, you just kind of have a separate module that identifies that this is arithmetic task and just use some just like a calculator to perform that task. But if it's just a part of your language model, it will not work at all because you cannot make, uh, learn multiplication algorithm by predicting which word comes next, right? It's beyond that task capabilities. Okay, so what else um, to finalize? We are a bit out of time. So, and similarly, there are some other like mathematic and logic reasoning tasks that they are failing to do. They were just not trained to do that. But they are pretty good in generating all this like uh, language that looks like real language, some uh, imitating some understanding of that language. Uh, but again, the, you should be very careful with this, like all these stereotypes and the bias. And also it's one of the problems that, that it makes impression that it's very anthropomorphic. It's like, I think I understand there is no I in this. It's just like statistical based approach. Okay, so let's uh, finish on this. Uh, thank you so much and uh, have a lovely weekend. And the next week we'll have first lecture about project, then the mid-semester test, and then advanced lecture about object-oriented paradigm. Okay, thank you.